Good day, and welcome to our webcast, Edge, Fog, and Cloud, part of the CFE IIoT Cloud Series, brought to you by CFE Media and Technology and sponsored by Epicor and Wago. Today we'll be joined by Ed Kuzemchek of Software Design Solutions and by Arlen Nipper of Cirrus Link. I'm Kevin Parker, an editor with CFE Media and Technology. Please stay tuned for what we know will be an outstanding webinar. Today's presentations can provide continuing education credits. CFE Media has met the standards and requirements of the registered continuing education program. Credit earned on completion of this program will be reported to RECEP at RECEP.net. A certificate of completion will be available for each participant to download upon successful completion of a test at the end of the presentations. As such, it does not include content that may be deemed or construed to be an approval or endorsement by RESA. To take the Learning Unit Exam, use the Learning Unit Exam tab option at the top of your screen. The exam will open in a separate browser window. You can complete the exam after the webcast. However, the link will break when the webcast signs off. You see in front of you today's learning objectives. Here are some tips to help you get the most from today's webcast. If you're experiencing issues with, your, with the slides or audio, refresh the browser or click the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's picture. You can control the volume of this webcast by adjusting the volume on your computer or on the webcast platform. For technical problems with audio or the slide presentation, click on the question mark at the top right-hand corner of the screen to access system checks to try before contacting an online technician. If a technician is needed, type a message in the Ask a Question box and someone will get to you as quickly as possible. The Ask a Question box is also used to ask questions of our speakers. The live Q&A session will begin after the presentation concludes. Today's webcast is being recorded. You will receive an email within a week with the link to the on-demand event. To download the certificate of completion, a PDF copy of the presentation, and additional resources, use the Event Resources tab on the left-hand side of the screen. Those documents will also be available with the on-demand version of this webcast. This webcast is being recorded, including the Q&A session. We'll send you an email message within a week with a direct link to the webcast archive. The exam will be posted on CFB Media websites with the on-demand version of this webcast. The exam is for one RECEP ASEC Certified Professional Development Hour. Before beginning the presentations, we invite you to view the following short videos provided by today's sponsors. At their conclusion, you may experience a few seconds of silence to compensate for varied internet speeds. Please stay tuned. Manufacturers are facing a barrage of information about how new disruptive technologies will change the face of their industry. But for manufacturers to embrace mobile, social, analytics, cloud, and industry 4.0, they must have a clear understanding of the technology value add within the context of today's business environment. With all this talk about industry 4.0 and data deluge from all the interconnected devices on the factory floor and analysis in the back office, Manufacturers may wonder, where does ERP fit into this new digital frontier? The reality is that ERP is more relevant in this equation than ever before, and manufacturers need the ability to contextualize data and integrate it into downstream process flows. To do this, ERP systems must be reimagined to meet the needs of new and emerging manufacturing technologies. Responsiveness demands simplicity and mobility, with tools designed to meet the specific needs of specific users. With an ERP system that delivers this, manufacturers can check off a big box on their Industry 4.0 readiness checklist and make good on the promise of real-time, actionable intelligence. The Wago PFC with cloud connectivity is easy to configure for your next IoT application. Compatible with all the big players like Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, IBM's Bluemix, or your own hosted MQTT platform. The configuration is done using the controller's web-based management, 
Simply choose your cloud and type in your account's IoT endpoint details and you're all set. TLS encryption is supported on all platforms. With that entered, you can monitor the network status to verify your controller indeed connects. If you do lose connection, the controller has built-in buffering either to internal flash or an SD card up to 32 gigabytes, just by selecting the cache mode here. The controller is now ready to publish and subscribe your data using the easy-to-use eCockpit library function blocks. If you'd like more information on this feature, please see the Wago application note in the link below. Welcome back. I'd now like to introduce today's first speaker. Ed Kuzemchek is the CTO and Director of IoT and Embedded Systems Engineering at Software Design Solutions, an applied visions company. Ed founded Software Design Solutions in 2003, focusing the company on embedded systems, machine to machine, and IoT software development. He led the growth of the company from its inception to its acquisition by Applied Visions in 2016. Prior to founding Software Design Solutions, Ed was Chief Software Architect for the Digital Signaling Processing Tools Group at Texas Instruments and a member of Tartan Laboratories, which developed highly optimized compiler technology for embedded systems. Ed holds a master's degree in computer science from the University of Pittsburgh. He is the author of several patents on embedded system software. Thanks for joining us today, Ed. The floor is yours. Thank you for having me on, Kevin. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about fog and edge processing. Uh, but before we dive right into that, I'd like to take a step back and kind of set a baseline and talk about some, some terminology so that we're all using the same words. So here's a picture of the classic three-tier IoT architecture. This may be very familiar to many of you. And I, I just want to put it up here so that we have an opportunity, as I say, to make sure that when we talk about edge, what are we, what are we all talking about? And are we talking about the same thing? Um, so generally, as I mentioned, IoT architectures have these three layers. At the bottom here, we have an edge. And that is the sensors that are connected to some physical thing in the world. They are sensing some physical attribute like temperature or vibration or perhaps humidity or light. They might be measuring activations on a tool in an industrial setting. And they're really doing just that. They're sensing one piece of data. Those sensors normally in this architecture would report their data up to the next level, which would be a lot of times what you'd hear called a gateway. And that is this layer of fog processing that we're going to get into a lot more as, the, as this presentation progresses. But that middle layer is really intended to gather the information and send it up to the, up to the cloud layer. Now, the cloud layer is what you might expect because of its name. That is where all the data is aggregated. It is all stored. It's where you have big databases. It's where you have the fancy things like dashboards and big data analytics and perhaps some machine learning there, although we are going to talk about where, how machine learning can appear at other places as well. But the, so this three-tier architecture is, as I say, kind of the classic architecture of IoT. It's good to have that baseline as we, as we enter the next part of our conversation where things might not be as clear at all times. It's good to come back to this and say, this is the kind of the, the quintessential architecture of, of IoT. So when we think about these three tiers, one important thing to think about is how many devices exist at each of these tiers. And so uh, starting at the bottom, in, an edge, in the edge device case, you have thousands or tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of de edge devices in your IoT system. If you have, for example, a manufacturing facility, and that manufacturing facility might have, say, six production lines in one building. And each of those production lines, those machines have a lot of 
bearings and shafts and actuators and solenoids and places where you need to, to measure for either quality or, or maintenance purposes. And each of those measurement points is often an edge device. And so as you step up one level, uh, the, the fog processing, that gateway processing, is those things that those edge devices report into. Again, so if you have your, your uh, industrial facility, this factory with six production lines, you may be able to uh, only have, say, six gateways, one on each production line, receiving all of the information from all of the sensors on that production line. And then finally, they're sending up to essentially what we would think of as one cloud. And so uh, although you know, the cloud may have tens or hundreds or thousands of servers, it's really more, uh, it's really in useful to think of the cloud as one scalable thing. You know, it, it, it may be small when you need it to be small, but as, as your needs grow and you just write a bigger check, you get a bigger cloud. And so the, the, the reason why this triangle is important is because when you're considering costs and you're considering return on investment, you need to keep in mind these numbers of devices because if you can save, you know, two dollars on an edge device, uh, that's a big that's a big savings if you have a hundred thousand devices. But saving even two hundred dollars on the on the uh, uh, on the fog device, in other words, the gateway, might not save you very much if you only have a, you know a few dozen fog devices. And so that's a very important triangle to keep in mind as we step in, into this a little further and we start talking about what kind of processing are we doing at each step. So here's a more full-fledged picture of the, of the three-tier uh, you know, processing that goes on in an in a, in a IoT system. I wouldn't call this a typical system. I would call this the, 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 the fleshed out, souped up version of, the, of an IoT system with kind of all the bells and whistles. And so you still have your three tiers. You still have edge and fog and cloud, but we see that there's a lot more going on, particularly in that middle layer, in that fog layer. Um, so instead of just being a simple message passing layer, the fog layer now starts to take advantage of some of the things that it, that it can do because of its position in the system. We'll get a lot more into exactly what happens at the fog layer, but specifically I want to point out here two things. One is I want to point out that, that machine learning is happening potentially in two places, both in the cloud and potentially down at the fog layer. And probably more importantly is that the fog layer or the on-premise portion is involved in what that big red arrow, that local fast loop control. And, uh, you know, folks who, are, or who have been in, in industrial control for a long time say, well, of course, that's just no different than a, than a SCADA system. And you're absolutely right, because that is what SCADA systems have been and all kinds of process control systems have been through their entire life. It's an on-premise system that is connected to the local sensors and the local actuators, and it is doing local, fast loop, real time control. And that's the important thing that we'll talk about in a little bit about FOG, that it is still do, uh, capable of doing this localized fast loop control. So let's dive down into each of these uh, of, of edge and FOG a little more. I'm not going to talk much about cloud here, uh, except to make distinctions of what's different between cloud-based processing and, uh, and edge and fog-based processing. Let's start down at the edge. As, as we remember, this is the, the sensors that are out at the very edge of the system. They are connected to something in the physical world. They are measuring a physical attribute like temperature or vibrations or, or, or light intensity or something like that. Um, as, that. as a result, they are tending to be real-time measurement of those values. Um, those sensors are, are 
the potentially the stock sensors that, ex that have existed in the system for a long time, or they may be new exotic sensors, especially in some of the vibration management uh, or vibration measurement uh, uh, operations. Those kinds of sensors have have, uh, have really progressed in, in their capability. But these sensors, it's important to note that they're sen that in a well-architected system, they are sensing one thing. They're sensing temperature, or they're sensing vibration, and um, and they're doing that very well. Uh, the other thing to note is there's a lot of differences about what makes an edge system. What 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 is what is an, an edge sensor? Um, you may have sensors that are quite sophisticated. You may have sensors that are that are DC or even AC powered. But often we like to think of sensors as potentially needing to run on a battery. And if that's the case, that introduces a number of new and different constraints to edge processing that didn't exist anywhere else. So we may have uh, a power efficiency concern with the battery operated sensors that wouldn't exist in other parts of the system. That really restricts the kind of processing that you can do on that system because processing costs power. It also can restrict the kind of communications that you're going to do on that, with that system because communications cost power, especially wireless communications and especially cellular communications. Um, the most important thing to remember about edge processing is that they live at the bottom of that triangle. In other words, there's many, many of them. And so cost sensitivity becomes pretty important because, as I mentioned, if you can save a dollar or two dollars on your edge sensors, that can really add up. Uh, last thing about edge sensors is they live in probably the harshest of the environment in an IoT system because they are at the physical, uh, the physical edge of the system where they're interacting with the physical world. And in, in industrial settings, the physical world sometimes a messy place. And, you know, you have temperatures and, and you have liquids and you have vibrations and you have abuse going on. And, you know, there's all kinds of things that sensors have to be able to survive just to do their job. And so that kind of wraps up the, the picture of, of what it takes to be an edge sensor and the kinds of things edge sensors can, can do with their processing. Generally, it's uh, often restricted to something like filtering. Now, Edge sensors are a pretty broad category, and I'm giving a fairly narrow slice in, into them. Let's step up a layer, though. Let's talk about fog. So fog has a lot higher processing power. You know, you're up at the next layer. You have multiple sensors reporting in. The fog processing box, in other words, the gateway, is likely to be able to be plugged into an AC outlet or at worst running off the same DC that is driving a lot of the system. Um, from a processing perspective, it has a much broader context. You know, it can read at this layer, it can read all the sensors in its local, you know, connectivity area. And in our, in our example that we gave a little bit ago, you have your entire production line might be reporting for, for one of the six production lines in our, in our, uh, uh, facility might be reporting into a gateway. It has all the information in its hands, so it can start to perform much higher level computing and fairly interesting uh, analyses, things like pattern matching and machine learning. And it can do those in real time without having to go up to the cloud. And that's the reason to bring some of this processing down to the fog, is to be able to do those in real time without having to send all the data to the cloud and pay the latency cost of a round trip to the cloud. Now we have a little bit less harsh environment. We've certainly seen gateways that have to live in a, you know, an IP66 or so, you know, area that can be washed down by a pressure washer. But I think that many times uh, the, the fog processing equipment has a little easier life than, than the sensors. So I've talked about you know, the classic three-layer uh, architecture of edge and fog and cloud. I've talked about how each can do its own, its own piece of processing, and the world is pretty nicely 
uh, sliced up between those three. Well, let me throw a little bit of a wrench into that and, and say that you know we might you know we might be looking at a little bit of a paradigm shift with some new technology here, um, and that is edge devices that could report directly to the cloud. In other words, you know, edge devices that are either wireless or wired or what I'm going to talk about here is low-cost cellular. Um, in recent years, um, and, and these are, you know, starting to be rolled out about two, three years ago, but now coming to full rollout are two uh, low-cost cellular data technologies, narrowband IoT and LTE CAT M1. And both of these technologies are cellular. They'll be able to run on the standard cellular network, allows you to communicate directly from the edge to the cloud. I think it's useful in very in many remote sensing situations where you aren't going to have anything but cellular. It's very useful in situations where you would only have one value to report to the cloud, say a remote um, meter on a pipeline somewhere. You only have, might only have one flow value to report, so why bother having a whole gateway plus a cell modem on the gateway plus a sensor? Let's just build it all together. It's going to make that sensor cost more, but it's not going to cost as much as a, a gateway and a cell modem and a sensor. So I think there's a lot of promising future uses of this technology. Um, has challenges, costs more, a little more battery life, but I think there's some real promising uh, uses of this paradigm shift. So let's summarize. Um, so I, I think the most important takeaways from what I was just mentioning is that IOT systems need a proper architecture effort up front. When you sit down to, to um, build or even design an IOT system, give some thought to where is the data and where can I do the processing where does it make sense to do the processing? Uh, figure out what your own triangle looks like. You know, I mentioned everything from, from a system where you might have one cloud, six gateways, and a few thousand sensors to a system where you might have one cloud, one gateway, one sensor. And the, the architecture would be very different there. The other thing is to prototype early. Um, you know, there's a lot of custom hardware that eventually will need to get built to cost reduce your IoT system, but that doesn't have to be done up front. Prototype with, with off-the-shelf sensors, get the data that you would need, even if it's not the sensors that you would end up fielding, and get that data and take a look at it. Last two things, keep in mind that fog processing has many benefits that we've already talked about. And keep an eye out for this low-cost cellular data. There might be places in your own IoT plans where this makes the most sense. So I talked a lot about gathering data and sending data, but I haven't said much about how the data gets sent. Um, uh, in our shop, we use a great deal of, of the MQTT that Arlen will be talking about next. So I'm going to pass this over to Arlen Nipper to talk about MQTT and spark plugs. Arlen? Thanks, Ed. Appreciate it. That was good. So yes, I am here to talk about. Um, you know, you said you know we have we have edge, we have fog, we have cloud. How do we communicate the information between all of those separate platforms that we've got out in the field? So one of my kind of tenets is that I've been I've been doing Skater for 43 years. Uh, I almost have been doing it long enough to to, to know what I'm doing in it. And, you know, if you look out in the environment, the, the thing is that this is 2020. So step number one, for real IIoT enablement using edge, fog, and cloud, we need to think about decoupling because I think in industrial controls, we, we've kind of been programmed to where, hey, we have a sensor. Uh, we must connect that sensor to a device with a protocol. And now if we want to be serendipitous with the data, we've got to go get it out of that device to get it converted to get it to the next level of device. So what if we could think about connecting devices to infrastructure 
and not to applications. Then we let best in class applications connect into that in infrastructure. So we end up with a very, um, with a much more uh, rapid deployment scheme and we can get into auto discovery of what's out in our infrastructure. Now, step number two is provide a single source of truth for all models, assets, and tags. And this is really starting to come to bear here lately because we have so many customers that are trying to take their edge sensors, their fog information, and get it collected into the cloud. But what happens is, is we end up with, much, with a huge number of process variables that may end up in a data lake somewhere on the cloud but we really haven't solved the problem. We've moved the problem down the road, but we haven't solved it. So we need to think about when we're designing these systems, we need to have the technology to not only uh, provide a, process, a, a raw analog value, zero to 4095, we need to provide a model that says, uh, this is a tur wind turbine. And this wind turbine is at this location. And that turbine has these process variables, it has RPM, it has wind speed, it has direction, and then be able to provide that as a model all the way from the edge all the way into the cloud so that we end up with a single source of truth. When that sensor comes online, it publishes its model, it publishes the assets that use that model, it publishes all of its process variables, and anyone consuming that knows they've got the single source of truth. And then finally, to Ed's point, we need to demonstrate, not only is this technology cool, but it's a better, faster, more secure, more scalable, more available infrastructure than the way we used to do it in over the last 35 or 40 years. Now, how are we gonna decouple? Well, MQTT is a, what's called message-oriented middleware. And that lets you Basically, it takes two, two things to build an MQTT infrastructure. You have a client, and you have an MQTT broker. And what happens is that client can connect to that MQTT broker and then publish information. Now, Andy and I had no idea in 1998 when we started working on MQTT that it would become one of the dominant IIoT transports used in the world today. But I think there's a lot of reasons behind that. You can see in these slides just show basically the growth. And this was a survey that the Eclipse Software Foundation did in 2018. Uh, I, was, I was thrilled when MQTT finally uh, became more used in solutions even than HTTP. And I think uh, going back to Ed's point, that's those tens and hundreds of thousands of devices in the world, and we've ended up with more devices than we have with human beings using HTTP. So if we look at that, you know, if, we, if we're thinking about engineering something, then what, what support is there for MQTT out of the box? Well, if we look at it in the first, at the, at the cloud layer, all of the major cloud providers, IBM, Google, Microsoft, AWS, all support ingest using MQTT. Several of the leading SCADA HMI uh, providers also support MQTT natively with a lot of sensor and controller of, of OEM device manufacturers building MQTT and Sparkplug natively into their devices. So let's take a look at what is MQTT. Why is it taken off? Well, again, I, I did mention that MQTT was, was invented, actually, to solve a problem for Philips 66 in 1998, 1999, where they had just received the first ever TCP IP based VSAT system. But they wanted to, but to, to that end, uh, VSATs are very slow. You have a lot of propagation delay, and in the late 90s, early 2000s, it was very expensive. So you wanted to be efficient, but yet you wanted to not be um, sending a lot of TCP IP traffic. So uh, the, the origins or the genesis of MQTT were based on the fact that it needs to be used in a mission critical 
real-time control system. So we had 8-bit microprocessors at the time. We were lucky if we had 64K of memory. So it had to be simple. It had to be extremely bandwidth efficient. I mean, we're, we were looking at some instances where a message might cost a nickel uh, to send it. And so if you start adding that up over an entire pipeline control system, that gets expensive. So it had to be extremely bandwidth efficient and it had to be stateful. Now, one of the major advantages of MQTT is you can do report by exception because it has state. And because you know that that device is out there, it's going to send you a piece of information if it needs to. But other than that, it knows that it has a TCP IP socket open. Now, the last thing is, is that it offers you the advantage of decoupling. If you think about this, I can have one edge node or one edge device publishing a pressure, and I can have 100 applications all subscribe to it. So that's where you get the one-to-many architecture of MQDT by decoupling it and not tying a device directly to an application. Now, a lot of people look at the MQTT spec and they go, well, Arlen, this is great, but we can't use it because it doesn't have any security built in. Well, you know, the, 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 the truth of the matter is Andy and I cheated. When we designed MQTT, we designed it right on top of TCP IP. So that is correct. MQTT does not provide the security um, for the networking. It's TCP IP. So with that, we get to use the latest and greatest TCP IP security uh, uh, methodologies, if you will. So today, that's that's TLS um, at the at the network authentication layer, and then of course within the MQTT infrastructure, you also have the uh, server access list where you have an access control list that can define who can publish on what topics and who can subscribe to that information. So. Are you there, Arlen? Well, I'm assuming he's going to cut out, um, uh, join back in a minute. In the meanwhile, Ed, uh, why don't we just uh, take care of some of the questions that we have coming from the audience until he rejoins us? Very good. Um, one question that was asked is, uh, when you're talking about edge and fog, uh, would you say that PLCs are part of edge or, or fog? You're back? back? All right, sorry. We'll pick that up later, Ed. Thanks. Very good. All right. I think I dropped out about at the point where I was mentioning that MQTT uses TLS and search to, for all the security. So if we go to the next slide here, MQTT was great. Uh, the, the beautiful thing about MQTT is you could put it on an Arduino. It's a very small footprint. And you could publish anything that you want on any topic. But as we started looking at, at industrial control, and a lot of vendors were starting to talk about MQTT. So we had the cloud vendors talking about it. We had the device manufacturers talking about it, the sensor uh, manufacturers. But everybody was publishing on a different topic, and everybody was using a different payload representation. So what Cirrus Link did four years ago is we sat down and we designed a specification called Sparkplug. And all Sparkplug does, it doesn't change MQTT, but it provides an OT-centric, an operational-centric topic namespace. Now, once we have a agreed-upon topic namespace, everybody knows what to subscribe to. So if everybody knows what to subscribe to, now I've got auto-discovery. The second thing Sparkplug does is it defines a way to publish a model and an asset definition. So now we're looking at this notion of a single source of truth. If my sensor can tell me what the data model is that it's going to use and all the process variables and all the engineering units and the ranges, then all of a sudden I have that notion of a single source of truth at the edge. It also defines a very efficient 
payload definition that was designed for process variables. If you look out in the world, a lot of people were using MQTT, but they were using it with XML and with JSON, and there's nothing wrong with those technologies. But let's go back to Ed's point, is that we've got to, you know, in our world, when we've got cellular and VSAT and radio, bandwidth is neither free nor is it unlimited. So we came out with a binary encoding so that we could stay with the original intent of MQTT to keep it lean and mean on the wire, but yet we use a technology called Google Protocol Buffers that most developers know how to deal with. So we made it efficient, but we didn't make it cryptic. Well, now with this, we can provide tag metadata. We can do auto discovery. Now that we've got this notion of an object, we can do store and forward because if our MQTT network drops out, messages that we would have published have timestamps in them. So that when we come back online, we can republish that information with its original timestamp and not have any gaps in our data stream. So one of the notions I'd like to point out here at this point is that the Internet of People took off really because of two things. One was an open transport called HTTP, and then the other was an open representation of what was in that transport using HTML. And with those two technologies, the Internet of People took off. Well, we need that same notion in the industrial Internet of Things. In other words, we've already got a free, open, uh, international standards, by the way, MQTT transport, and now we've got a, a definition of what that transport is, what is what is being published, and what topic is it being published on. So with that, with Sparkplug and the, the yet the concept of a single source of truth for all OT information can finally be realized, and now we've got that edge fog cloud where everything can be interoperable. So as I go through this, if people want to learn more about this, uh, the Spark Plug specification and all of the reference implementation code that Cirrus Link wrote in Java C, um, JavaScript, and Python have all been donated to the Eclipse Software Foundation. So if you go here, I've got a, a shot of the website. Uh, this is called the Tahu Project, and all of the information that you need to know about Sparkplug and how it's used in MQTT is on that site. And the next slide here is we've now formed the Sparkplug Working Group. So this includes Chevron, Inductive Automation, O-Ring, uh, Canary Labs, Cirrus Link, and this is a working group where we're all trying to get together and officially go through the Eclipse certification process with the, doc, with the uh, Sparkplug specification, and then start getting all of the feedback that we've gotten from the thousands of customers that are using this on how to make Sparkplug even better in future re revisions going forward. So I, I really encourage all of our listeners to you know, go to these two websites, take a look, and see what information is there. So in summary, again, Fog Edge Cloud Solutions, they need what I've learned and what we're finding out even more is um, how you've got to think about a model asset tag definition in order to replicate at scale. You can write some code and you can get some data coming up, but if you try to replicate that across verticals, across different markets, at different locations, you've got to have that single source of truth at the edge. The other is we need an efficient transport over that last mile. And I will mention here that in the 20 years that we've been doing MQTT, if we compare it against any other conventional poll response protocol, we've been able to show by replacing that poll response protocol with MQTT, we've got an 80 to 95% bandwidth reduction for the same data at the same update rate. And finally, as I mentioned, we, these solutions must be able to leverage the latest in TCP IP security models. So with that, um, Kevin, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Arlen. 
Um, now our presenters will answer questions for the audience. Please type your questions for the presenters in the ask question box on the screen, and we'll get to as many as time allows. Questions that we don't get to today will be posted online with the archived version of this webcast. Remember to download a certificate of completion, a copy of the presentation, and other resources. Use the event resources tab. Arlen, my first question for you is, what, what do you see? Uh, it's a topic that Ed touched on. Uh, is there a role for machine learning on edge devices? Oh, a absolutely. We're we're seeing that um, again since we're so involved with MQTT and Sparkplug, a lot of the fog um, solutions, if you will, are leveraging those. So we already know that people are putting machine uh, learning and um, uh, what do they call it? They're using things like SageMaker on Amazon to create an inference model, and then they're taking that model and they're publishing it back down to the edge device to run the inference model. So we're definitely seeing um, analytics and machine learning at the edge for sure. Good. Um, another question for you, Arlen. Uh, how does OPC UA fit into this framework? Well, not very well, actually. <laughs> well, um, OPC UA, it has its purpose. I mean, it, you know, it's been around for a very long time. A lot of PLC um, and, and SCADA HMI systems use it. But it's not really designed to do that decoupling that I talked about, nor is it designed very well for a single source of truth. Although OPC UA has its data model, um, you know, you can imagine trying to put an OPC UA server on the sensor, and it just doesn't work. I mean, it's too compute intensive for the purpose. So in a lot of cases, you know, I don't try to uh, compare OPC directly uh, against uh, MQTT, but with, with the emerging technology that I see, uh, other than closed loop real-time real control, uh, we've been able to accomplish everything that we need to with MQZT now with the spark plug specification and being able to put the model and the representation right on top of it. Um, I think there's a lot of solutions that will uh, probably use MQTT and spark plug in lieu of OPC UA. How long in page numbers is the specification for MQTT? Arlen? Uh, the the original one that Andy and I did, I think, was 18 pages. Um, the I think after it came out of the Oasis standards body, it's 51 pages now. Yeah, and how long is the specification for OPC UA? Um, I believe last count was 2,000, greater than 2,000 pages. Thank you. Um, I had a question for you. Uh, one of our listeners is asking, in that distinction, that gray area between edge and fog, do you, where do you see the PLC? That's an interesting question. And um, I will say that it depends on what the PLC is doing. Um, if the PLC is doing sensor reads and some simple filtering, I would put it on the edge side. If the PLC is really is, is is a higher level, you know, um, you know, and that ladder logic is reading several sensors, making choices, uh, doing a, a, you know, doing maybe some feedback, then I would push that then I would push that PLC into the into the fog category. I mean, I know that that uh, that that another that another um, uh, reader has asked. You know, well, where's the defining line? Where's the, the international standard? I can look at something and say that's edge and that's fog, and there really isn't one. Um, and and the, the the line's a little gray, and it really comes down to um, what kind of what what kind of definition works for what you're trying to do. I tend to say that everything that is connected to a physical sensor ends up being called edge. Um, but uh, if you're connected to one physical sensor, that's a convenient definition for me, and uh, and, and that's kind of where we where we uh, reside with that. So I could see PLCs on the edge. Generally, I would put them in the in the fog level because they're probably doing more than one thing. Good. Uh, thanks, Ed. Another question for you. 
Um, with your discussion about the paradigm shift where you mentioned edge devices reporting directly to the cloud, do you think that eventually the gateway or fog layer will go away? I, I think that it will really depend, uh, you know, to, in order to do that, the the edge devices uh, would need to be able to run on such low power and still be able to do some of these pretty sophisticated, you know, cellular technologies. Um, so I guess the short answer is I don't see it going away completely. I think that because of the triangle that we talked about, that the the use of really low-cost edge devices and many of them reporting to an intermediate gateway is still going to be a very compelling model for a lot of use cases. Thanks. Uh, Arlen, would it be fair to say that Spark Plug is of particular interest to those who are interested or want to use MQTT in a SCADA environment, or, or are we off the mark there? No, it was it was absolutely it, the, the spark plug spec was absolutely invented to address the the SCADA controls market. Uh, we, it's used a lot in manufacturing now. It's used a lot in logistics, but uh, we needed a standard way to get process variables, you know, from edge of network devices that were connected to PLCs or uh, sensors like heart smart transmitters and get that data efficiently into a SCADA host system. So definitely was invented for SCADA, but you know, now with all of the different customer usages, it's everywhere from you know, uh, warehouse control systems to food, beverage, um, oil and gas, uh, solar farm monitoring. Uh, the uses for are very wide now. Good, a uh, real detailed question for you, Arlen. Is Sparkplug's MQTT binary data sent with error-correcting error code? Or is there a possibility you sacrificed reliability for bandwidth? Uh, it leverages TCP IP, remember. So all of the error correction and, and packet reassembly and all of that is handled at the TCP IP level. So, you know, in theory, I should not be able to get uh, erroneous uh, packet through a TCP IP network. So no, Spark Plug, uh, sorry, MQTT at the protocol level does not do error correction. We rely on TCP IP to do that. Thanks. A uh, question for both of you, I think, but I'll ask it of you first, Ed. Do you have any advice on tools, technology, or development kits for rapid prototyping sensors at the edge? How would you speed up this process? I think there's a couple of things that you need to do rapid prototyping. Um, you know, first you need the sensors um, and and something to read them, and then and then secondly you need somewhere to send the data. Um, so, uh, for someone starting down this path, see what sensor you need. If it exists for something really cheap and fast, like an Arduino or an Intel Grove device or something like that, go that route. Because those systems can be, can be conjured up in Python or in Arduino C in, in their IDE, and very quickly you can get that data. Now, somewhere to send it. Here, we built a system just to receive that kind of data for prototyping, and you know, that's, that's very useful. You can also just send it up to, uh, up to AWS and kind of look at the data raw that way. But I think that you know, from a hardware and sensor perspective, find the sensor first, and then find the easiest, quickest thing that can read that value, and don't get hung up on the fact that it might be, you know, uh, it might be considered a board that high school kids use. Alan, any comments? Uh, I would say that 99% of my customers that are already playing with MQTT and already playing with IIoT, um, they have a Raspberry Pi on their desk somewhere. They're using Node Red with the built-in MQTT message flows. Um, they're going to some of the open, uh, you know, the free level of either Azure or Amazon IoT Core. Um, and they're prototyping some really cool solutions. So I agree. I mean, you can find all kinds of sensors 
uh, that are compatible with the Raspberry Pi or Drino, BeagleBoard, uh, you've got Node Red, you've got the tools, uh, you've got the PAHO library out there in Eclipse for all of those MQTT tools, you've got the Tahoe library for all of the Sparkplug tools. So there's just a wealth of, of really good, inexpensive ways to get started with uh, getting your hands on this technology. Uh, good. How would Sparkplug MQTT fit into an architecture like Iridium's short burst data? Arlen, any comment? I would say I don't know enough about that to be able to comment on it at this point. Good. Um, Ed, are the, if the sensor is currently used in a lot of um, uh, locations or implementations, would they need to be replaced to do edge computing, um, or, or could you use what is already in place? Generally, the sensors don't need to be replaced. Um, you may need to augment the sensors uh, or, 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 bring, or bring the data into some localized little unit. Um, like, but for example, one of the most important things about industrial IoT is you can't roll into a, uh, a, an industrial shop and say, we can make this all IoT if you just replace all of this equipment with new. And that's just not going to fly. You know, if, if the, if the uh, metal stamping machine already has a temperature sensor on this bearing, let's just use the sensor that's there. Now, it might be putting out an analog value that went to a SCADA machine. So maybe we'll have to put, as Arlen mentioned, a Raspberry Pi or something to prototype that analog value to get it into a, a form that we can get it up to the cloud. But I would leave the sensor there if you've got a sensor. Thanks. Um, Arlen, Federico has enjoyed your presentation. He has a question, and it is about real time, in quotations, for, in MQTT. Are there extensions? He means if some process needs a maximum lead time for operation, is MQTT ready also for this? Or do you need an infrastructure to manage it? Well, there's real time and there's real time. Um, most of our, I mean, with all of the testing that you, you can go out on the on the internet, you see all of the testing that's been done on MQTT. You can see where brokers can handle tens of millions of messages per second. So the the overhead of MQTT is so small that I would consider it real time, but I would not consider it real time um, mission control. In other words, I would not use it for closed loop control. Closed loop control is a whole nother uh, uh, area, safety concerns and all that. So I wouldn't recommend it for that. But I will mention that with Sparkplug and with all the tooling that you've got, you can actually measure your latency. So with all the systems that we have, I not only do I have a timestamp of when the process variable was read, I have a timestamp of when it was published. So that means for every, so we have systems with, you know, over 7 million tags, right? Well, I can tell you the latency in milliseconds of every, of all those 7 million tags, and we can set boundaries on the fact that, hey, if this latency gets over this many milliseconds, then we need to raise an alarm. So that is one of the cool things is that you can measure your system, and you re there's really nothing you have to do to have your own internal monitoring when you build out an MQTT infrastructure. Good. Uh, Arlen, which Eclipse IoT projects are specific to MQTT, MQTT Sparkplug? Uh, the one specific to Sparkplug is called Tahu, T-A-H-U. And the one that's specific to the MQTT protocol itself is called PAHO, P-A-H-O. This is a funny question to me, just in terms of the words that are used. Is there an Ubuntu image with Mosquito and park, Spark Plug for testing on a virtual machine? <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Uh, yeah, Mosquito's out there. You can install, it's got installers for, for all the different versions of Ubuntu. Uh, remember, Mosquito is just an MQTT server. Sparkplug does not require 
any special MQTT server. As long as it's a 3.1.1 compliant MQTT server, uh, Spark Club will work through that server. Great. So as we're approaching the end of our broadcast time, is there any, now that you've seen Arlen's presentation, is there any comments that you may have or a question like you'd like to ask him? I do have one question. Uh, so, so Arlen, uh, you know, I have taken the MQTT journey as well and, and with our customers and starting out in MQTT sending XML and then MQTT sending JSON. And as we move from XML to JSON, we of course realized the, the, the 5X reduction in bandwidth uh, that we needed because of the, of the wordiness of XML. And so now, as we, especially with these cellular devices, look at binary, I, want, I wonder if you could comment on the relative tax I would pay on using spark plug binary versus hand coding a, a binary schema that, that I would have to make sure that the edge device and the, or the, the say the edge device and the, the device it's reporting to both have to automatically agree on. So what would I pay in tax in terms of size versus, a, versus just coding that binary? Well, I'll give you a good answer, Ed. The original uh, Phillips 66, uh, um, myself and John Lujan was the other engineer, Andy Stanford Clark with IBM. We handcrafted that, that binary, uh, 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 man, was it lean and mean, but it was also unintelligible. I mean, you yeah. couldn't write enough documentation. If this bit is set, you go to here and, you know. So I would say we double from, from the most cryptic binary, when we moved to Google protocol buffers and using a schema and then using their binary encoding, we probably doubled the message size, but still an order of magnitude less than using JSON. Oh, I agree. Yeah, I mean, because just ASCII-izing uh, numbers, you know, you end up with more than oh, double. Yeah. Yeah. So that yeah, that's great. Thank you, thank you. That that's very that's very useful. I, I'm I'm you know, I'm a user. After this, I'm you know, it, it's it's shameful that I didn't know about product, about Spark Plug before this, but now I'm going there. Yep, it's a it's a very widely adopted uh, uh, technology. Yep. Well, that's great. I think that. Um, um, part of what we do is bring people together, and uh, that's a graphic illustration of it. Uh, we're kind of at the end of our broadcast today, though. Uh, I'd like to thank the audience for the great questions, and uh, thanks again to our really expert speakers and uh, who have command of their, uh, their brief, uh, Ed Kuzemchek and Arlen Nipper. Um, now that we're just about done, we'd like to know how we did. Um, the exit survey will pop up on your screen as soon as the webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it because we use this information to improve our webcast. Finally, on behalf of CFE Media and today's sponsors, thanks for attending and we'll see you next time.